Ethereum's merge. This is one of the biggest stories in crypto, and it's now, as a project, moved one step closer to its end goal. ETH 2.0. Yesterday, we witnessed Ropsten, that's Ethereum's longest running test net, successfully transition to proof of stake as an algorithm, so from POW to POS. Many investors, as well as Ethereans, do have a lot riding on this successful transition to POS. We're all hoping for the best, of course. But there is still a lot of confusion around it. And you know what? Understandably so. Ethereum is trying to redesign the plane while the plane itself is still flying effectively and is up in the air. So of course, it's gonna be confusing and scary simultaneously. Then there are the ETH Maxis, who for the last two and a half years kept saying that the merge will happen in another six months, and then it was in another six months, and in another six months. Even the ETH developers don't really know when it's going to happen exactly, but they expect it to be soon. But here's the thing, with Ropsten on POS, we now have this new ray of hope that has broken through the cloud cover. Some important questions come to mind with regard to this final merge. What do we know? What don't we know? And what can we ultimately expect from a successful implementation? That is exactly what we're covering in today's video. This one is all about the Ethereum merge. Welcome to the channel. My name is Maddie and this is Altcoin Buzz. We are a crypto investment research company. We have documented many 100x returns on coins and tokens that are top projects today, really before anyone else was even talking about them. And if you want to see our detailed process for researching such projects, then our new and improved Altcoin Buzz Access Group is for you. Our plans start at $99 monthly. Be sure to click the link below for more information. Whether we're talking about Ethereum, other cryptocurrencies, or any kind of financial asset, just remember that investment does have corresponding risk. And so as you're watching this video, yeah, soak in the information but do not consider it to be official, financial, or investment advice. And with that, let's talk about this historic merge. Now, why did I use that term just now? Why is the Robston merge such a historic event? Well, it's a crucial step before Ethereum's actual transition to the consensus layer, which was formerly known as ETH 2.0. In essence, the Robston merge will give developers the first taste of what things will look like in the future when Ethereum finally makes that move to a less energy intensive POS algorithm mechanism. And it's pretty clear that a successful merge on the test net would bode well for Ethereum's mainnet and its transition. The process has been in the works for some years. It's been a while. And in fact, Robston was kicked off in 2016. So it really has taken quite a long time. With multiple delays, yes, there were some waves of frustration that were sent out among the community and investors, of course. But the new POS model is supposed to solve many of Ethereum's biggest issues, such as high transaction costs and the network's ability to scale. So the stakes are indeed very high, this being the biggest upgrade in Ethereum's history. And so if it is successful, it's most likely going to be the biggest event in the crypto industry this year. But before we break down when merge, why merge, it's important to get some context straight and take a look back on Ethereum and its progress up until now. This is the best way to give you a better sense of why this merge is so crucial in the first place. So Ethereum already has a couple of controversial aspects in its history, all of this before the merge delays were even something that we were discussing. The ETH Foundation, which includes Vitalik and other co-founders like Gavin Wood, who went on to found Polkadot, as you may know, the ETH Foundation started in 2014. And the foundation's goal really from the beginning was not to be money like Bitcoin, but to be the system that people built their decentralized apps on, kind of like a decentralized version of Microsoft Windows. That's not controversial, but pre-mining is, and Ethereum did a lot of that. Bitcoin had a fair launch, meaning anyone could mine and get the 50 BTC block reward. And then anyone could trade their coins to others that may have wanted to buy. Ethereum, who started and still uses miners in a POW system, they mined their coins in advance, which allows heavy insider concentration. In fact, a full 10% were mined in advance just for the ETH foundation. And that's kind of a big deal because the creation of coins through mining is supposed to happen as the network is in use producing blocks the way Bitcoin and other POW chains do it. And this is exactly why you hear all kinds of people, not just Bitcoin maxis, say that ETH is a scam. 
If the industry was larger at that time, many would be facing criminal prosecution, in our opinion. That's the likelihood, at least. There are arguments of potential fraud or self-dealing for the portion of the pre-mined coins that the owners sold to themselves, at least allegedly. But then 2016 happened with something that threatened ETH's very existence altogether. This was the DAO hack. The first major DAO on ETH was hacked during its ICO. For those of you that were in the space, you may recall that ICOs were a pretty big deal back at that time with the hype that the NFT and IDO drops kind of have now. That was more or less the equivalent ICOs that is back in 2016. And in this hacking event, the hackers took 3.6 million ETH, not $3.6 million, 3.6 million Ether. And so what the Ethereum Foundation decided to do was hard fork ETH, rendering that 3.6 million ETH worthless. And the community voted to do this, but many wanted to keep the immutability aspect of the blockchain. These are the so-called code is law people. Those in favor of immutability and keeping the old chain as it was forced it to become what is now ETH Classic, which without much fanfare is the number 28 project in crypto. We don't often talk about ETC, Ethereum Classic, all that much, but not bad. Actually, today it's number 30, but still, a pretty good and fairly perennial project that's been around for quite a while. But what about those that decided to go along with the hard fork? Well, they represent the community behind Ethereum that we know and love today. That's the number two project, of course, only behind Bitcoin. So look, ETH, to be fair, is not without its problems and controversies. But that being said, let's switch into a more optimistic gear and look at the impact of the merge and what it really represents. Okay, first question, why merge? Well. There are a few reasons why ETH may want to make this change. Tech entrepreneur and Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban explains in a Fortune article why he thinks it's a hugely bullish move to go to POS. And in a nutshell here, the main reasons are that there's environmental advantages, scaling issues are nearly solved, if not entirely. There's the ability to add sharding and also fewer ETH issued after the change along with EIP 1559. Let's talk about that first reason. So the environmental concern is a major one. Even legacy financial publications have been talking about this POW mining thing and they're not crazy about it. Now, Bitcoin specifically and other POW chains have reasons to continue using it, especially for security. But for ETH, it's actually a pretty good move and projections are as high as 90%. That is to say, there's gonna be 90% less energy usage with a POS for this particular blockchain. Scaling issues are another big deal because ETH can't scale. I mean, that's the main issue here. For every new CryptoKitties or Bored Ape Yacht Club collection or new game that gets popular, it really bogs down the network. It slows to a crawl and gas prices skyrocket at the same time. And this is why Axie had to create its own sidechain Ronin just to be able to run their game. Many people don't know this, but gas prices vary based on the type of transaction you have. So for example, today, a USDT transfer of the ERC20 token, there's a range, but the average price that you're gonna pay is $3.69 in gas. But if you wanna do a swap on curve, for example, let's uh, scroll down just a little bit, you can see the average is more than 10 times higher, $51 and 22 cents, which means that this is not a great deal unless you're moving a lot of money. But for smaller amounts, it's not efficient and it's not effective. And this dynamic unfortunately creates a trap for small retail ETH users because it costs more than the amount they have in gas to move their tokens, rendering them stuck where they are. And very often they'll choose not to use the network at all in these circumstances when costs are that high. The ability to add sharding is another very, very important feature. So Vitalik Buterin himself has said more than once that sharding is the future for Ethereum. And it's actually easier to add sharding to a POS chain as opposed to a POW chain. And the primary reason is that with a POW chain, part of the work involved means that every node downloads and holds onto the entire history of the chain. That's great for authentication, but pretty lousy for speed. And sharding is a system where the nodes or validators in this case only have to hold part of the chain's information. The information is spread out over many, many validators and there's enough redundancy that if some validators happen to go down, well, the system can still access every block in the chain when configured correctly. 
So if the validators don't need to hold or download the entire chain's information and history, it can move a lot faster. And this would give ETH the scaling it desperately needs. Zilliqa and Nier both use sharding, and this increases their throughput transactions per second and brings costs down, significantly so. Finally, we need to address how fewer ETH are gonna be issued after the merge and EIP-1559. So miners get rewarded for finding the block with the block reward. And that reward comes in the form of new coins issued on the POW chain. That's the same as how Bitcoin works. And for now, that's how ETH works too. But after the change, there will be no more miners. New ETH will go to validators for validating transactions and at a smaller emission rate than the current one for POW. So first and foremost, fewer ether will be issued. And then you also have EIP-1559. Put in place last year, it changes the fee structure to include a base fee that users pay regardless of the type of ETH transaction. And then a tipping mechanism comes into place where you can add to that if you want your transaction processed faster. You could think about it like taking an Uber or maybe by using some other transportation app wherein you have a base price and then the additions for things you request like door-to-door -door service or maybe card processing fees what have you. The big difference is not just the price structure, but the fact that ETH now burns the base price. So add the lesser issuing and the burning of the base transaction fees and you get fewer ether. Some even believe it could make ETH deflationary overall. Look at it this way. On a daily basis, ETH is burning about 4,000 ether and the total so far burned is almost 2.1 million. That is a lot of added value for existing holders. And the net issuance at the same time as those 2.1 million are being burned is 1.2 million ether issued. So it is deflationary, at least for right now. But note that as the consensus article says, 1559 will not reduce gas fees. In fact, none of these things will help reduce gas fees. But if some of the scaling options do work effectively, then the network will have fewer gas price spikes than it has in the past. All right, and when can we expect this massive merge? The short answer is that we don't know, but there are some credible projections that suggest it could happen this summer, 2022. But is this a case of, hey, it's gonna be ready in another six months yet again? We don't know, but at least this time around, we're watching what the developers are saying and doing. And after all, they are the most informed on the subject. And they actually believe it's shipping by the end of quarter two. And the POS chain, known as the Beacon chain, is actually on testnet right now. We've covered this in the past. Okay, but what about the impact on the market and L2s? One of the things we know is that it takes 32 ETH to become a validator. And that's a lot of money, but actually much less than many other POS pools. But if you don't have the 32 ETH as a requisite, you can join a pool and every exchange you've really ever heard of pretty much has one of these validator pools. In fact, there are over 300,000 validators right now and we expect that number to grow because the competition is heavy and returns are gonna be low in the modest three to 5% range. We also know the network fee will run faster and chances of it getting bogged down by isolated events like a super hyped NFT collection, those chances will decrease as well. What about L2s? Well, Ethereum developer Marius van der Weijen says he expects layer two solutions to still be the solution to scaling ETH now and in the long term. Payment channels and rollups will continue to lead because layer two solutions just reached $7 billion in TVL, in total value lock. That is a new record. More and more ETH users are turning to Arbitrum, Loopring, Optimism, or Polygon for more speed and lower fees. And look, the main point here is that sharding and POS together could be the long-term scaling solution for Ethereum. But that being said, when the merge happens, what will mostly occur for ETH users is more of the same. Gas fees will likely not drop, not right away, and layer twos will still continue to grow. We see no reason for them not to. What about all these so-called Ethereum killers? Well, first of all, almost all of them run POS already. They all run faster and process more transaction than ETH does even on their EVMs. And for many, they offer more than just the Ethereum virtual machine. Avalanche, for example, is one of a few that made a dedicated separate chain to run EVM with its C chain. 
and other apps use a different chain. Cardano does this as well. So chains like these or like Polkadot and maybe Cosmos that have other goals like interoperability should not see much change in demand when the ETH merge happens, at least not in our opinion. In fact, we think there's enough room for all of them to grow. It's not slices of one pie, it's multiple pies that are being baked here, all of them delicious, all of them have different flavors, and there's room for a lot of winners in this space. That continues to be our perspective. So that is the latest on the merge. What do you guys think is gonna happen to ETH when the merge does take place? And what are your thoughts about your other favorite chains, how they're gonna be impacted? Projects like AVAX, Sol, FTM, Luna, Dot, Polkadot. Do you think that they're gonna get positive or negative after effects from the merge? We're gonna find out soon enough, but curious to know your thoughts about this. As always, be sure to sound off in the comments below. If you're still watching this video, kudos. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to receive notifications. Never financial advice, but best of luck, genuinely. Check out these related videos popping up here, popping up here. Stay safe out there, members of the Altcoin Buzz Army. And as always, we do hope to see you again soon in our next video. Take care.